Today is March the 20th, 2013. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University with the Oral History Department there. And we're in Norman, Oklahoma today on campus of the University of Oklahoma. Correct? Yes. Correct. <laughs> and we're with Dr. Fred Brock. Uh, he was an original member of the steering committee for the Mezzanet. And he retired from the University of Oklahoma in 1997. Correct. Correct. Thank you for joining me today. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's start with learning a little bit about you, uh, beginning with uh, when and where you were born, and then we'll work our way forward. Okay. Well, I was born in uh, Chillicothe, Ohio in 1932. Uh, and my father was a civil engineer. I suppose that like... Uh, most, this is a difficult time, it was the Depression, and this went on for, of course, for quite a few years. So, we, he moved us around uh, where the jobs went. And so, we didn't, never grew up in Chillicothe, Ohio. We, we went to uh, West Virginia, and from there, uh, he got a job working on uh, the Panama Canal. So the whole family went to Panama Canal, Z zone air, the, the zone area, which is part of the, was then part of the U.S. It is not anymore. Uh, so we were there from 1939 to 1943 during the, the war course and um, when came back uh, to Ohio lived in uh, um, Her Somerset Ohio and then from there to uh, Dayton Ohio and then Columbus Ohio <laughs> not Cincinnati huh <laughs> not Cincinnati no so that's um, where did you graduate from high school? Uh, from uh, Columbus, Ohio. Columbus. And then I went into uh, um, Ohio State University, where I was a confused person. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know what he wanted to do. Changed your major a few times. Yes, yes, did. I did manage to graduate, though, which is quite a thing, considering I didn't do very well. And, and, and what was your degree in? It was in uh, education. And then uh, after that, I, uh, I went into the Navy for a couple of years. And then um, when I came back, I went to... Uh, University of Michigan to master's. become a, uh, yeah, get a master's degree in meteorology and liked that so much that I stayed there and got a, another master's degree in uh, instrumentation engineering. Okay. Your grades must have improved. Things improved then, yes, yes, it did, <laughs> uh, definitely. How did you get interested in meteorology? At Ohio State, I had taken two courses from uh, Professor Dingle, who was then at Ohio State, obviously, and was interested in that. And so uh, when I got out, it turned out that Dingle had moved on to uh, University of Michigan, so I sort of followed him there and uh, got a job, worked on the, the master's degrees and stayed at the uh, university for oh, 12 years. After getting the degrees, I stayed working there. Uh, 
And then um, after that, I decided it was time to uh, get a uh, PhD and went to uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, to um, here in Norman, the uh, University of Oklahoma, and got a PhD in meteorology there. After that, um, I moved um, to uh, Colorado in the uh, Boulder area, where it was um, the National Center for Atmospheric Research is where we went. And stayed there for oh, about 12 years. And then uh, there was an opportunity to come back to Oklahoma as a professor in uh, meteorology. So I did that and been stuck here in <laughs> Oklahoma <laughs> ever since. Uh, and uh, that's why we're here. You were there about 12 years too, I guess. Yeah, it somebody pattern. pointed out that I, I seem to have a uh, half life time of about 12 years, and then I moved to someplace else. Wow. <laughs> Did you have brothers and sisters? I have two sisters, and one is in Columbus, Ohio, and the other is in New Jersey. So they're sort of spread around a little bit. Your, your father was a civil engineer. Did your mother have a, a career? or? Um, she... Went to um, the University of um, Ohio State, not not Ohio State, it was uh, University in Ohio at, um, I forgot where it was. Anyway, um, she was working on um, education and left before the uh, before, she, before she got the degree uh, I guess because she got married mm -hmm. and yeah. other complications that come along that way you know. <laughs> uh, so education was always important to them too yes it was and um, I think when I look at my history of what I did and where and how it happened, I always felt um, very lucky that I got the opportunities that I did at that time, which were visible to everybody, but uh, I think that's the main thing in my history was, wow, that was lucky. <laughs> <laughs> well, in high school, was science your favorite subject? Uh, yes, it was. And probably math, if you got into instruments. Um, at that time, they didn't push math very much. And uh, I took what courses they had, but um, I don't think it, it amounted to much, really. Uh, so we never got into uh, calculus in high school, which people do now much more. So. Well, when you were in the Navy, did you deal with meteorology or that? Thing? No, I, I did not. Um, um, I was just a, uh, a line officer on an aircraft carrier. And that's all there was to it. <laughs> Except I learned, the main thing I learned from that was that uh, I am somehow not qualified for the military life. There's something that I didn't quite get, I guess, or couldn't cope with very well. So I decided that something else other than military has had to be. And university is a little bit more freedom, right? Yes, it was. When I got to... Uh, University of uh, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, I 
found it was fun. I liked that and stayed there for obviously for a long time. I really thought that was that was okay. I liked that. And your second master's was in instrumentation. Yes, instrumentation engineering. Engineering. So, what do you do with a degree with in that? I've never uh, met anyone so. Uh, well, it turns out um, when I was most of the time in uh, meteorology. And so I became more interested in the instrumentation that we use in meteorology. Okay. Um, and thinking about the way they measure and take the measurements and keep them. Um, and I want there was more things that I wanted to do then to, uh, to get better education, get better uh, instrumentation, and get um, get things to work better. More accurate? Accurate and getting them better. Um, at that time, when I was working with uh, some systems that we had, um, they didn't use computers. At all, really, because well, part of it there wasn't computers available then that were really suitable, um, and so when you look at, uh, say, a, uh, when they met, sometimes instrumentating a small aircraft, and what you would see is in a very compound, very crowded combat place where there's barely room enough for the observer and here's all this instrumentation. Well, all of it had buttons and switches all over it. And that meant to me that when you looked at that, what is the probability that they would set this all up correctly and use it during a flight without somebody bunking into a switch or something and changing the way the system was supposed to be working. And that to me was a crazy way to do it, except of course, at that time they didn't have that much, I mean, computers weren't available that could do it. But at the same time, when I was um, at, um, in Michigan, there became, uh, smaller computers became available. They were also working on the big ones, of course, but uh, my interest was in the smaller computers. Um, and you could take these and just a few instruments and make something that becomes a data logger and become something that um, is more easy to use, but these things weren't really available for field work yet very well. I mean, it was some people did, but it was very, very touchy. These, these first computers were if you bumped them there, things would happen that were not good. Uh, but by the time I got to NCAR, microprocessors had begun to appear and we could use them. And it made a huge difference. It really, it made it. then finally we could, all these back, the things that I had learned at Michigan, finally came together when I was at NCAR, and we could start making computers that had little computers in them, or instruments rather, that had little processors in them, and um, 
we've been doing it ever since, and better and better and better. And that's what I really, really liked. <laughs> Improving data collection and consistency and all of that. Yes, and have computers that you can take out into the field and work. And that's what you see today when you look around this room. There are, there's one right here, there's another one there, there's, you know, this room is full of them. And that's really what they're doing. Everything is done with uh, microprocessors configured for um, data collection. They're programmed, of course, so that you can change the program. And but that's that's was really, really what I was interested in. That's a long way from high school to that. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So I went from the era of strip recorders to microprocessors and being able then to actually also send the data. <clears throat> so when I was at NCAR, I built a Spill a small mesonet using microprocessors and with communication so that the data would be transmitted immediately to a central station. That had not been done before. Okay. So we were doing that. Uh, it's primitive system compared to the mesonet by any means, but it worked. And in fact, we went on and built another mesonet system that used uh, satellite communication, which meant that the stations could be anywhere in North or South America, <laughs> really. <laughs> so, again, that, that system, that uh, mesonet system was very um, primitive compared to the one you see today in, in the mesonet. Uh, but each step along the way, I was making better, mm -hmm. interesting systems that I liked a lot. And that was what I was fun of doing. Well, the, the mesonet, Oklahoma mesonet, was it, it wasn't in place when you came to Oklahoma. No, it was not. And so that was the skill set that you brought and added to yeah, the project. Yeah, and at the time, when I first got involved in the mesonet as in the steering committee, um, they hadn't built anything yet. It was just, but it's so important to think that um, Ken Crawford and Ron Elliott put together the concept of the mesonet. They designed exactly what they wanted, what were the goals of the system to be when it was finally to be built. And they put together the budget for the project and actually got funding. They hooked up, got an agreement to um, use for communications. Part of it was going to be through OLETS, the Oklahoma Law Enforcement System, which was an enormous advantage. This meant that they wanted to put stations all over the state of Oklahoma. And there had to be a communication system that could get that data through from the stations wherever you put them out to a central station, which today is in this building. Um, and 
OLETS was an enormous advantage. What we did was we built, or were going to build, had started yet, but a, a two layer system where the data from the remote station is sent by radio, low power, that um, they would take it from there to the first OLET station, which would be a, a, a police station or sheriff's office or whatever. And they would take it from there and bring it into this building. And that's was, so when I got involved in the mesonet, all this had been done. And the first manager, which we were working on, had a, it was an exciting time because all of this work had been done. We could start working on it. I'd imagine that you have the the uh, the uh, the goals were very specifically well known. We wanted to meet. It was 108 stations scattered all over the state with at least one in each county and measuring both uh, meteorological and agricultural parameters. As I say, they had funding had been available. So whoever got into the manager Go, 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 because it was ready to go. And that was, i say, it was a very exciting time. And it was a lot of fun, I must say. To, it turned out that I was the, the first manager. So you got and, to go, though. Uh, <laughs> I said, it was, uh, it was what I really wanted to do, and this was fun. And there were no obstacles, really. It's just go, go, go. And we did. Um, were you were you involved at the time that they were trying to get funding from the governor? No, or, that, that they had us already, already done before I got there. Okay. That's the most important part, of course, is you know you get the funding and then. Uh, but then you have to realize, oh, I've got this now. We've got to do something. Yeah, we got to do it. <laughs> and that's. Uh, that's where you came in. Yeah. And as I look back on it, I, I say this was, it was exciting, it was what we wanted to do, and it was all doable. Mm -hmm. We knew right away that we could do all of this. And of course there was, I wasn't just me alone, but there were other people who were working with it. There was, there was a team, a Mesonet team, was doing all this work and it, things matched together I thought very very well sure. with uh, so you got to take your system in Colorado and just expand it yeah uh, clearly it is a much more complex system with many more stations that what we ever did. Um, but another thing is that the technology that was available then for Mesonet had come together where things could be done much more easily. And so we were doing that getting all of these pieces together. Um, one thing that we did, part of my experience with other mesonets was that it is not enough to build a system that gets the data, transmits to wherever you want it to be, um, you think about the case of 
the mesonet, you're putting over a hundred stations, 108 stations, all over the state. And there is a total of, you know, upwards of a thousand stations, of a, of a thousand instruments among those t hundred stations. Okay. And that means that um, things can go wrong, you know. Murphy's Law and all that. So if you had a thousand stations see it all over the state, there is a very good chance that as soon as you turn your back, one of those systems, one of those instruments is going to screw up in some way. Do what you did not want it to do or to fail. And you're trying to, after all, turn to people to use the system and believe that the measurements are correct. So how are you going to verify that? This is a problem in data quality. And the question then is, okay, you got the data, but now what's, what is the quality of it? And this meant that that's what this room is about is calibration. Okay. But you taking about a thousand stations or a thousand instruments, you cannot, physically cannot, take the instruments and send them back to the manufacturer to calibrate them, to fix them up. Uh, they were happy to do it, yes, of course, but you can't afford it. So that's why we had to have a calibration system here so that now when every instrument comes through the door, they check the calibration again. The manufacturers, of course, do this. They have a good calibration system, better than ours usually. Uh, but nonetheless, we check it just to make sure. Mm -hmm. And then we send it out into the field. If there is a question about it later, or if any instrument is brought back for maintenance, we do the maintenance and we calibrate it again, make sure that it's right. All that is not enough. You have to also be aware somehow of the data that you've got. And when you think about how much data is flowing, you can't just uh, look at it by hand and say, that yeah, looks okay, pass it on, uh, that's not going to work. So that means that at the base station, which is here, um, you have computer programs running all the time, constantly, to look at the data. I mean, they've got the data, they got it here, okay, but now they got to look at it and see whether it fits within general grounds, general ideas of what you expect on a certain day. A station and the neighbor one disagreed by a lot. You might wonder about that a little bit and start thinking, you know, is this really right? And so there are programs that are running as they all are very sophisticated programs now uh, that look at the data to adjust it to try to guess whether it's working properly or it's doing well. But in the end, of course, the computers don't change, don't fix a problem. They help in pointing out where the probable errors are. But then somebody has to look at it and say, well, does that look like a reasonable measurement or not? And <clears throat> if it is not, what happens next? What next is, of course, you turn it over to somebody, like in this room, 
to uh, ten, take somebody out to wherever that station is and get that instrument and bring it back for testing and for recalibration then and then send it back when it's when it's needed. So there has to be a lot of people involved in this. It's, it's, it's an automated system, yes, but um, all the work in the field obviously is done by people. So they have to go out and reach each instrument every once in a while and replace any that are questionable. And then after they're fixed, bring them back. So it's an automated system with uh, a lot of hard work of people. And it seems like a lot of checks and balances. Then. That is exactly right. And that is a very, very important part of the whole system. If you're not doing that, uh, how can anyone really trust your, your measurements? And so it's a key part of, um, of the system is to work on data quality and make sure that things are as good as you claim them to be. Well, when you were the manager at the very beginning, did you have someone that would go do that or was that you? Uh, all of these pieces were being put together at the same time. And, um, but some of it, yes, we started off almost right from the beginning, um, putting together um, a calibration system. It was in another building at the time, and it was much primitive compared to this one. I mean, when I look around here now, I almost don't know what we're talking about. What are these things anyway? Mm -hmm. uh, but we had put together a much more primitive system. But we, right from the beginning, we started doing that because when we bought all of the instruments, you, know, you bought and buy about 120 computers or systems, instruments, all at once at the beginning. Um, here again, the manufacturers are very good people and they're trying to do their very best and they do calibrate and they do check and they do all these things. But nonetheless, we checked it again anyway. And, you know, once in a while something will because they're people too. They're... So we did all that work. But of course, as when you put together a system like that, you initially, you think you, you've built the perfect system that is just as you want it to be. But if you look back now, it's been, what, 10 years now? Uh, the, the manager today, right now it's uh, Chris, has put together a system where I almost can't recognize things. There's the calibration system that we're in here now. As I say, I hardly recognize all the pieces, although I know what they're supposed to do. Um, the instrumentation has been upgraded significantly since then. And what they do with the data is far more sophisticated. The quality control, the control system is far more sophisticated than anything I'd imagined. And so what you're seeing is a dynamic system. It didn't stay stack, static just because we built it at a certain point. It has been improved all the time. 
and the measurement system, the mesa system today is far better than the original one. And it seems to be improving all the time. And the data products that they develop, are, again, are far better. And so I think that uh, the Mesonet today, to work on it, is exciting as it was then. It's different in a way. Yeah, we're not building the whole system all at once, but they are constantly improving, and that is a very important thing. Did you actually write like a policy manual or a procedures manual or standards or something for this part of it, for your part of it? Like when something is to be done? And it was not as a manual as such. There was not a um, manual that was put together. In Good question. I... This thing seems like things had to happen in an order. Things had to happen in order in some respects, but in all, many respects also. We were doing almost everything at once at the same time, it seemed, uh, initially. What was a, a big challenge? Was there something that was more more of a challenge than other. I mean, funding was in place, so was there something else that kept you awake at night? <laughs> <laughs> it caught my attention all the time, for sure. <clears throat> <clears throat> I think it was the Initially, there were so many things we were started off with uh, what was it with? We were writing specifications for everything, okay. and then we mean in you. Or mostly me. Mostly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, of course, then you have to go through the uh, uh, procedures in the university for buying things. Mm -hmm. And this is enough to get people's attention to go out and buy 120 of something at a time. Mm -hmm. the people pay attention to do it right. <clears throat> and we were. Testing, of course, we had a station right next to the building so that we could um, put together some of these ideas and make sure that it was working the way we wanted it to work. And at the same time, we're trying to build together uh, the calibration system. So there were a lot of pieces coming together more or less at the same time with different people working on them. Um, but as I say, it was a very, very exciting time. Did you have to go out into the field to the sites or they, someone else did that? I didn't go out in the field very much, occasionally. Okay. Well, if a machine or an instrument was broken, would they take and replace it? Or would you have extras to replace it with? No, they'd have, yeah. We started off buying a few extras. Just in case. Right from the beginning, so that uh, when it inevitably something fails, mm -hmm. and you send somebody out and uh, replace it with another one and, and do that. So, yes, the, uh, that was going on. I guess we were developing these procedures. As we went along, we, there was no manual to start with, for sure. And I don't know if there is a manual today. But, uh, uh, 
just different job descriptions, I suppose. Yes. I guess you'd have to ask Griff's, the, the current manager, whether there's a manual or some sort <laughs> now. There may very well be. Well, when I mean, it started, he's so organized. When you were the manager, how many people were under you? That's a good question. Initially, it may have just been you. Well, no, there had to be other people involved immediately because, um, first of all, people had to go out and get the sites. We didn't. Once you know, okay, we're going to use OLETs as part of it. Now that means, but then we have another link that goes from the the OLET station, the uh, sheriff's office, sheriff officers, whatever they are, and um, we have another station, another system then that takes. Our system has a little transmitter radio, transmitter radar and that transmits the data from there to that station. Now that has to be done by line of sight radio. And that means that uh, the station that has got a um, 10 meter mast. Um, and so the antenna could be up there at the station, but then it has to go to the stair. The, uh, you have to ensure then that the link between the station where you want to put it and the sheriff's office or whatever um, has to be a one of line of sight. And in Oklahoma, that's generally not that hard to do. It's, but it's surprisingly how difficult that could be sometimes. Because even in a smooth earth, you say that there's no mountains or in the way, still you, with the uh, one antenna at, uh, say, 10 meters and another in farther up, um, still, you get a range of about 20 miles. So, uh, you, so there are definite limits and where you could put the station out there. So you, somebody had to go out and find these places and they had to make sure that the, uh, the radio communication would work. And then they had to go and um, get permission from somebody. Well, somebody owns all of the land somewhere, and it's a farmer or whatever, and get permission to put the station there. Somebody had to do that. And then um, somebody was putting these systems together. There was um, a fence around the whole thing so that cattle or whatever weren't using it and the tower had to be put together and the instruments and put on and um, all this was done. So uh, there were all kinds of people involved at the same time. And then we're at, at the same time putting together the, the base station computers, which um, had to take the data from uh, OLETs and then install it somewhere in a computer and then make it available so that somebody can look at it and use it. So I've gone all around the question <laughs> of how many people working on it, and I don't really have the answer. Probably to today, there's what, 25 or 30 maybe today? I would imagine. Around in there? Yeah. When you first started, did you think it would still be in place 
20 years later? We hope that, but uh, it depends. You hear the initial funding, but then someone has to start getting continuing funding. And the key for that <clears throat> is that you have a product, data product, that is useful to somebody. Mm -hmm and they're willing to pay for it. And the key to that, it turned out, was having quality, data quality. Nobody's going to pay for data unless they can be assured that the data is correct mm -hmm. and it's doing as, as we said it would do. That's a huge step. Big step, reliable. Oh. Yeah, there have been other station, other systems that I have seen or see that other people do, where data quality was questionable, sometimes non-existent. Um, and then, if you look carefully at the data, it becomes obvious that. Uh, this is not a good system, that, that the data is not right. And so that was part of, incidentally, data quality, among other things, involved taking pictures of the remote station so that somebody could look at it and say, okay, that station is measuring meteorological for correctly or agriculture or whatever. And we had a, a, a folder of all these pictures at every station so that somebody could look at it and verify. That, yeah, that's right. We really are. This is how we're doing it. This is where it is. That's how it's done. And that's part of data quality, it turns out. So there was a lot of steps there to get all that done. Some of these were started right from the beginning in the sense of taking the pictures. But I'm sure that uh, data quality system that you have now is uh, probably much, much better than, than in my day. Again, everything has been improved so much. The people who have been... So that part of the question was the funding to keep going and the reason, and that's why it is so important to have data quality and make sure that it is because as I say no one will buy it unless it is unless they can assure you that, it, that data is correct and so it's a continuous process of getting funding to continue the system to keep it going and that is why you hope when the system is put together that all of it will work that way and that the project will be able to continue. And the people who have been working on this system have done a wonderful job of that. <clears throat> so that it is going on, it is something going on today. And that's why when I look around at it, I don't recognize parts of it because <laughs> they have been improving it all the time. I understand it's kind of looked at as the gold standard. Mm -hmm. It's it's re it's recognized internationally and, and nationally as a as a very good system. Actually it is. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, and
Now, I don't know whether any other station, whether any state has a system like it. That would be surprising, but it, I, Chris would know whether. Uh, I'll have to ask. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, because when you look at all of the problems, the uh, getting stations, getting everything put together, working right, having the communications, that is such an important thing. Uh, data communication system is crucial for a mesonet especially as one for the whole state. And getting that right is absolutely critical. The rest of it is not going to work unless you can do that. And so people have to do that. They have to get the communication system. They have to do maintenance and quality assurance. I guess not many, I'm not aware of any other station, other state that has a system quite like it. Maybe that has something to do too with our weather we have here. Well. <laughs> not really, I know. <laughs> well, we're, we're famous in that regard. <laughs> you go around. Practically the other state, they will say, oh yeah, we, we know all about Oklahoma and Norman, Oklahoma, because that's where the weather center is. And people, most should know this. It always surprises me sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they know that. And of course, that's where they have tornadoes. <laughs> and that's where they have the mesonet, so. That's yeah. what we're going to try to get people to learn more more about you guys. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's, it's an interesting part of Oklahoma history, too. I guess so. Mm -hmm. Kind of unique. I think it is, again, Chris could answer that question better than I can. The extent that it is unique is not dependent on any one particular component of the mesonet. It's all the system, all of the components put together and all of the things that, that they have put together and improved, as I say so many times, over and over again. Um, Which make it special, I think, in that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, 20 years worth of data is a lot of data. Yes, it is. It's a lot of data. Um, and a lot of different users of, yes. of, of that data. And again, uh, Chris could answer that one better than I. Well, when it was first started, it was primarily geared toward agriculture or? Agriculture and meteorology. And meteorology. Yeah. And that's what we were talking about. Um, both Ron from uh, OSU and I was going to say, I got mixed up here. Um, <clears throat> Ken Crawford here at OU. These two people had definite ideas about what they wanted, but they had a, 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 a the goals were designed 
to meet their needs. In the case of Ken, it's meteorological and with uh, Ron Elliott, who is more agricultural. But they both see it, had a need, and those needs have not uh, gone away. And they were smart in having a steering committee of people who, I mean, players at the table, all had something major to contribute. They certainly did. And again, when you go back to think about when I first got involved in the mezzanine, all of this was set up already. Mm -hmm. They had a, the foundation was set very, very well. Not just they knew, as I say, the uh, the uh, the goals were clear. The uh, funding was available, and they had the structure which they had put together, which had a steering committee, which worked very very well, I must say, and the. had all the other people getting involved in the thing so that uh, parts of it from Oklahoma State and part from OU mm -hmm. uh, worked together very well. I don't think there was ever any uh, con problems. I think things worked out most of the time. That's what I'm getting, the, the big picture, it seems. They played well together. Yes, indeed. <laughs> worked well together. I guess I said it's played, but worked well together. Yeah. Well, do you envision it continuing on for another 20? There's no reason why it shouldn't, as long as the money's there, I guess. Yes, I think certainly it would, considering up until now, uh, the people have been constantly improving it. And there's no reason why that wouldn't continue. Right. I think at this point, I would imagine that everybody is convinced that uh, this was a a good thing to do and it is paid off and so they would continue it I hope. Well I understand this room we're sitting in was dedicated in your in your name a few years ago. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Oh well uh, that was one of the, kind of surprising to me. Before you answer that, let me switch tapes. It's the Fred V. Brock Standard Laboratory. Did I get that right? Yes, I think that's right. Okay. Um, if you go back to other stations, other universities had put together Mezzanets before. It was, it was not the first one to do that by any means. And some of those were common in that um, they would put stations out, have some sort of communication system, and start using the data. And the, their whole goal is, of course, to use the data. That's what they started for in the first place. But what they didn't do was work the quality control problem. And just didn't. And so, over time, um, they just uh, 
come apart over time because they just didn't do maintenance properly. I'm not pointing at any one particular in that, but it, but it was fairly common, in fact, that uh, it was difficult. They weren't, in, weren't interested in data quality. They just assumed it because they had it originally, they thought, and got to go. From my experiences at um, NCAR, I knew that this was important. And so when we first started out here, I started putting together um, a calibration system that um, could work, uh, much primitive compared to what you see around this room now, but nonetheless, it worked. And I guess that was not technically one of the goals of the Mesonet at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but they humorized, they let it go, I guess. You, and, con you convinced them of the importance. Yeah, eventually that. And I think one of the convincing arguments is as we put together the system together, we had more stations up and running, doing these things, uh, they started looking ahead at more about continued funding. Mm -hmm. And for agencies who might provide the funding, they made it clear right from the ending, right from the beginning, that they were not going to fund anything that was continuing unless they could be assured of the quality of the data. And we'd already put together that system, at least in the beginning that way, we had a calibration system that we could use. We had some software that was monitoring the quality of the data. And we had pictures of the station so that they could be convinced that yes, in fact, these are reasonable places that you're not putting a station in a hole someplace and then calling this mere logical. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so then people were really convinced, yeah, this, this was a good thing to do. It was, in fact, essential. So they did it. Well, when they decided to name this room for you, did they come to you and say, this is what we'd like to do? At that time, I had retired. And uh, I got a call one day and somebody said, well, we're, we're thinking about naming the room after you. And I said, huh, why? <laughs> uh, I, thought of all the other names of other people who were involved and suggested, well, maybe they would be better. But they put the label on me. <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of what was the beginnings of this room was your responsibility and, you know, was your, yeah. your work that got to this point. Yeah. So... It's an honor and a privilege to speak with you today. Well, it's a privilege to talk about all of this from this perspective, since it is system has worked so well. Did you take some of what you were doing in, in this aspect of uh, the Mesonet back to your classroom? Yes, uh, did some. Um, 
it's a little hard to do in a way because I think data quality is not what they're they're interested in. Those students around here are interested in tornadoes. They're interested in the, the product, mm -hmm. how you apply it, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, not very are, people are really interested in the data quality or what it took to get there. Let's get to the application. But nonetheless, some of that was done, yes. I don't know how much is of data quality is put into any program, any uh, courses now. Probably not as much as should be. Probably not. And um, mostly it's on the, on the job training, I think. It's been a pretty good run. I thought it was, yes. <laughs> I thought the whole thing was a, was a fascinating project. Do you know how they came up with the name? I mean, it was for why wasn't it the Mesonet work? I mean, all one word, and then now it's just the Mesonet. I think it was Mesonet from the beginning. Okay. Probably um, Ken Crawford probably came up with it. Okay. Uh, as I say, there had been other networks before, so it's not new in that sense. But were those other networks called mesonets? Frequently they were. Okay. And I said what was different was making this one to cover a whole state. And it was the number of times the data was gathered. While every That's right. We were collecting data at every five minutes. Five minutes. D 24 hours a day. You know, yes, 24 hours five. a day. Yes. Well, that's a lot of data stored somewhere. There is indeed. And I think, you know, when I first looked at it, I thought, what a wonderful, wonderful thing that OLETS was agreeing to transmit this data for us. Uh, I thought that was wonderful. I still do. I think it's <laughs> wonderful. Uh, and it turned out that, uh, although it sounds like a lot of data, and the fact that we're transmitting every five minutes, uh, winds up in terms of the load that was otherwise in uh, OLETs was trivial. Okay. So that our demands were pretty light compared to other things that they were going on at that time. Um, so they didn't have much problem accepting us. Although I guess other states have not seen it that way. And if they don't have the equivalent of OLETs in the other stage, other states, that's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. now, why some of them didn't want to participate, I don't know, but uh, it was, I think the all those people saw that right from the beginning that they were interested in this data, they wanted it. They were going to use, use They were it. going to use it. That's right. And I'm assuming they don't have to pay for it since they're letting... That's right. Users. Yeah, right, right. It's pretty good trade-off. And in that sense, uh, we were not much of a load on them. They didn't have to do much because um, we added, bought a computer for each station where we were going to be in, getting in data in 
And uh, all that they had to do was they provided a, a computer program that would take the data that we got and make sure that it was in uh, the format that they need and send it on as part of uh, NOAA, of a LOA, OLET's uh, stream, mm -hmm. which is directed just uh, to this building, nowhere else. So I think for them it was a fairly easy task. And, um, but I thought it was, I still think it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing that they agreed to this. I mean, and the other thing with the timing was just right with the computers becoming more and more accessible and price oh, yeah. rise and yeah. just the whole internet and all that has yeah. just been very helpful yeah. to yeah. this. Yeah, the computers that, well, personal computers that we get now are so powerful, it's hard to remember that you, 10 years ago, um, they weren't nearly as powerful, but they were more than adequate for our needs. Mm -hmm. Better than pen and pa paper, pencil and paper. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> so. Well, is there anything else you want to add before we before we close close out? made some notes of things that I wanted to make sure that I said. Please. And I think I've covered my points. Do you measure rain at your house? <laughs> I do. I do, yes. It's a uh, very Simple system, but, but yes. Okay. Just curious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming today. Well, thank you. For